I think it was light under the circumstances, and and I think it makes it difficult going forward for judges to impose more than that for many, many cases, because like I say, very few brought loaded pistols to the Capitol and had a fully assembled loaded AR-15 in their hotel. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, August 25th, 2022. While everyone's eyes have been on Mar-a-Lago, you might have forgotten that there's a January 6th investigation going on. And while everyone's been looking the other way, there's actually been some action in it. Major sentencing developments. Some people have gotten some real time, but have they gotten enough? There have also been cases going to trial, bench trials. We have some new data on which cases are resulting in convictions, which ones in acquittals. A bunch of defendants have been trying to get their cases moved out of Washington, D.C. altogether. And, of course, there have been developments in that small, pesky matter of litigation under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, the disqualification provision. To go over it all, I sat down in the virtual jungle studio with Roger Parloff, joining all the way from France, We talked through it all. We talked through the recent sentences, the escalating numbers, and whether the Justice Department may have hit a ceiling. And we covered all the other stuff, too. It's the Lawfare Podcast, August 25th, a January 6th criminal update with Roger Parloff. All right, Roger, it's been a while since we've done a check-in on the January 6th criminal side. We've all been so distracted by Mar-a-Lago and related matters, but the January 6th investigation has not stopped while we've been focused on Florida. Uh, So give us a little bit of an overview of where we are. Sure. Well, there, we're up to 855 cases have been charged in federal court. And these numbers I'm using come from the uh, George Washington University program on extremism. Uh, there have been 364 guilty pleas already. So that's about 43%. And then using my own figures, I think we've completed 13 trials involving 14 defendants. That's eight jury trials and five bench trials. And uh, in the jury trials, the government has won convictions on 43 out of 43 counts. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's uh, effective. And uh, in bench trials, it's won convictions on 22 out of 30. Uh, That's uh, 73%. All the counts that have ended in acquittals have occurred in bench trials before Judge Trevor McFadden and uh, one uh, misdemeanor defendant who elected to have a bench trial before him by bench trial, I mean non-jury, was acquitted completely. So can I can I ask whether there's something other than Judge McFadden that these acquittal counts have in common? Are they, is McFadden was he confronted with a a particularly weak case or set of cases, or was he particularly friendly to uh, one six defendants? What what explains the eight acquittals before him? Yeah, he is known to be hostile or or suspicious, I should say, of the nonviolent, of the cases against nonviolent defendants. We've only had five completed bench trials so far, and four of them have been before Trevor McFadden. And I don't think he has more cases than anyone else. I think it's that people realize he's given some very lenient sentences in nonviolent cases, and they suspect that he might be a better person to, to go with. And he's going to, in fact, the, the, he's going to have three more are going to go to trial in front of him next week. So wait, do, do you mean that, that, that defendants are 
choosing a bench trial if their judge is McFadden, whereas if the judge were anybody else, they would be having a jury trial? I, uh, well, uh, there's no way to know that, but I think it's, it's, it's noticeable that we're going to have uh, almost, uh, I guess, nine defendants will have chosen to have bench trials before him as of next week, as opposed to, I think, just two others that have chosen to have bench trials before anyone else. And he has had a jury trial as well. And I did see some of the, uh, I saw one of the cases where there were three acquittals of counts. And uh, I think that they were right. So I did not see one that was controversial where he, he acquitted entirely. So it's hard for me to, you know, but he is definitely convicted on plenty, plenty of counts too. So, you know, it's, it's, it would be a subtle thing, uh, nothing uh, untoward. Mm -hmm. Different judges have different attitudes about all kinds of things. Yeah. He's interesting. He's a former uh, police officer, actually. You know, it could also be that people just want to save a little money. I mean, it's it's a clear phenomenon going on. Interesting. So what can we say at this stage about the state of the investigation based on, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about the unindicted cases in these investigations, the Jeffrey Clarks and the John Eastmans and etc. But when you look at the summaries uh, of numbers that you've just described, what does it tell you about where the government is in this investigation? Well, I don't know how much these cases do tell us about the investigations that are reaching higher up and, and that are looking at not the riot itself, but at, um, you know, the alternate elector scheme. So uh, they're pretty distinct. I mean, obviously, almost everybody, I mean, a, a huge percentage uh, of the defendants were clearly hanging on every word Trump spoke. And many of them, you know, say, yeah, I'm, I went because he said to go. Also, I find that some of, some of them know a lot a surprising amount uh, about the alternate elector scheme, which a lot of us who, you know, did not read their news sources uh, did not really know that much about and weren't, or at least weren't taking very seriously. So I have no idea if that at, at some level spurred the DOJ to eventually go off in that direction, but they seem to me sort of pretty distinct inquiries. And I think they have distinct grand juries. You know, there's a grand jury focused on the the riot, the insurrection cases, and there's a grand jury focused on the alternate elector type cases. But you haven't seen any case yet that connects the various dots. No, no, I really haven't. All right. So we've had our our first major sentencing following a jury trial recently. Let's talk about the sentencings that, that have happened recently. Mr. Guy Reffitt, what do we know about what happened to him? Yeah, he was the very, he was the first to go to a jury trial. And uh, it was a very serious case. It was one of the few cases where the guy went to the Capitol with a loaded gun on him. And uh, it was a 40 caliber Smith & Wesson. And he had also brought to Washington across state lines. He, he, he came from Texas with a buddy, and both of them brought pistols, and bro both of them brought AR-15 assault rifles loaded also. They left the assault rifles uh, at the hotel, which was in Georgetown, which, as you know, is doesn't permit assault rifles. Yeah, just note to uh, listeners outside of Washington, D.C., when you come to Washington, <laughs> leave your AR-15s at home. There are no circumstances in which it is okay to bring an AR-15 into the District of Columbia. 
Yeah, and um, and actually they knew that. We know they knew that. And, and Refit was also a very, he was active on social media. He was active with a three percenter movement. He made lots of, he made videos of himself and so there was a lot of incriminating stuff. It was very clear he came with the goal to obstruct the congressional proceeding, which was another charge, uh, the uh, corruptly obstructing the congressional proceeding. And then when it was over, he went back to Texas. His kids were not thrilled with what he'd done. He realized that he threatened them. Uh, his son was taping when he threatened them, uh, some of the threats. And uh, he said things like, you know, uh, traitors get shot. And uh, so that was another account. And and then he, he, even after January 6th, he began plotting other crimes, which he put on video and in, in texts and messages. So it was an aggravated case. And then uh, even after he was arrested, He continued to uh, issue very unrepentant manifestos from jail. So his guidelines were not easy to compute. And the uh, probation department gave one guideline range and the DOJ gave a much harsher guideline range, and uh, which went up to 14 years. And then the DOJ actually wanted to enhance on top of that, give him a 15-year sentence based on the fact that they considered what he had done terrorism. This was the first case that they had tried the terrorism enhancement. And all of this struck Dabney Friedrich. I think it made her, she was the judge, it made her uncomfortable that the the previous high for any sentence uh, was and of course it was a guilty plea was 63 months two defendants who had engaged in pretty violent assaults on police officers had gotten 63 months so a little over five years so what the government was asking for was almost a decade more than the highest to date so it looked like they were punishing him for going to trial but As I've mentioned, there were a lot of things that were unusual about his case. She ended up imposing a sentence of 87 months. So that's exactly two years more than the uh, highest guilty plea sentences. And it was reported generally the way it was reported and the way she described it, it, it was at the bottom end of his guidelines as she computed them. But As I said, the probation department, which does this for a living, computed a range that was two years higher than that. And the DOJ, which also does this for a living, computed a range that was two years higher than that. So it it was, you know, it's hard to say that 87 months, which is uh, seven years and I think three months, I may be getting that wrong, is, is not a long sentence. But it's less than half what the government wanted. And I wonder if it will, in effect, set a cap for a lot of cases because no one else brought, I mean, very few others are have been proven to have brought a loaded pistol to the Capitol. On the other hand, he, he did not assault police officers. He impeded them, which means he had body armor on and he, he disregarded orders and he helped lead a group up the stairs. And because he had body armor, he could resist their pellet guns. And he was an important player in in the assault. I got to say, I mean, I think the sentence feels very light. Uh, So let me make the case against Guy Reffitt here. So number one, this guy more clearly than anybody else so far Uh, who has gone to sentencing, came to Washington for a revolutionary act. Uh, That is, he came to stop Congress from counting the electoral votes. He brought a large amount of weaponry, uh, including illegal firearms for that purpose. He engaged in various acts of obstruction in order to uh, shut people up. 
And the idea that all of that is something that merits seven years in prison strikes me as a little bit hard to understand. I think it was light under the circumstances. And and I think it makes it difficult going forward for judges to impose more than that for many, many cases, because like I say, very few brought loaded pistols to the Capitol and had a fully assembled loaded AR-15 in their hotel. And very few continued to plot new crimes after they came home. And in fact, you can see that because another defendant already has been sentenced to exactly the same sentence, 87 months. This is Tom Robertson. And his crime was much, I think, uh, less severe. Okay, so let, let's let's talk about him. In what sense was his crime less severe? And how did he end up with a comparable sentence, notwithstanding that? Yeah, in his case, the government had asked for eight years, which was the middle of his guidelines as the government computed them. And uh, the judge gave him the bottom of those same guidelines and that was 87. He was a off-duty police officer from Rocky Mount, Virginia, and he and a younger associate, I mean, a younger police officer that sort of looked up to him, he brought the younger guy and, and a neighbor to the Capitol, and he brought a big stick, which he used essentially. Now, he, he went to the Capitol he impeded officers. He did not assault them, but he used that stick the way that you see riot officers use a baton, holding it sort of crossways. I've forgotten what they call that. There's a term for that. And he obstructed three metropolitan police officers from getting to a line where they were trying to hold the line. And and then later on, he did enter the Capitol. But that was about it. That would have been it, except that um, when he was released on bail, he then ordered 34 firearms, bought them, and against uh, the terms of the release. And in fact, it's a, it's another crime. Under indictment, you aren't allowed to traffic in arms. And uh, in, apparently these were stored at a neighbor's and he had a key and and there was a lot of lying lying at least this was how the government uh, saw it um lying to the probation department lying to the court and uh he had also lied it turned out he was a veteran uh and it's he and according to the government he had lied about he said he had a uh, purple heart he'd said he'd been an army ranger these were all lies so there were aggravating things for sure but to equate his crime with uh, Refit's is a stretch. And uh, they both got exactly the same 87 months. So it'll be interesting to see if that 87 months becomes a cap. And there's a case right now, Kyle Fitzsimons, who he's had a bench trial before Rudolf Contreras. He's a very, he was at the Lower West Terrace archway, you know, that where the most violent medieval-like fighting was occurring. And he injured, he didn't just assault, he injured three police officers, one of whom had to take medical retirement. That's Acalino uh, Gunnell, who testified last July, a, a, a year ago, July, in the very, very first January 6th House Com- Select Committee hearing. Another uh, one that was injured was a uh, an officer with a Vietnamese name, Nguyen. He pulled his gas mask ajar uh, away from his uh, face while another rioter sprayed bear spray into the officer's face and then let the gas mask go so that it trapped trapped the bear spray in there. And the officer testified that he, you know, he thought he was going to die. So this is a serious case. And um, I think it might get a longer sentence. And and we're going to have more of those as these are coming. 
the next bench trial in front of Trevor McFadden is going to involve uh, three more people at um, uh, l- the Lower West Terrace. And um, I think that's, that's a very serious case. So, but it'll be interesting to see if we go over that line. Yeah, so it's possible that this is functionally going to set the line for people who, however violent they may have been, it did not result in officer injuries. But then there's some other line for the actual cases where Capitol Police or MPD actually uh, sustained injuries. Is that plausible? It's plausible to me. Yeah. I I do believe his guidelines will permit a higher term up to about 108 months. They won't permit it as high as Refit potentially was flirting with, unless they sought a terrorism enhancement again. Right. But I think it's important to remember here that this is all before you get to the cases in which the government has charged uh, seditious conspiracy, right? I mean, there, Absolutely. there's all, yeah. these are just the the routine riot cases in which either there are injuries among the officers or not. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So seditious conspiracy is... I mean, technically, it's 20 years maximum, and and some of these other crimes are also 20-year maximums. But the guidelines don't talk about seditious conspiracy per se, but the closest analogy that they do talk about is treason. And that's a bigger charge than even uh, corruptly obstructing a, a congressional proceeding. I should also say that there are people that fought in the Lower West Terrace, that uh, there are some who are not charged with a corrupt obstruction of a congressional proceeding. And I think that relates to just basically how much did they use social media and how much did they use, you know, do their own videos and, and show, leave evidence of what their state of mind was. Some of these people were just silent and it's hard to prove beyond a reasonable doubt what their intent was. All right. So uh, let us turn to the defendants who are trying to get out of being tried in the District of Columbia altogether. Uh, You have a piece out in Lawfare headlined Escape from D.C., uh, in which uh, you evaluate the plausibility of venue change arguments from January 6th defendants. Give us a little summary. Uh, Is anybody going to succeed in getting their cases uh, venue changed to, say, Western Pennsylvania or uh, (laughs) West Virginia or any of several uh, locations where it would be much more convenient uh, if you're a January 6th defendant to uh, select a jury? Yeah, I don't think so. And not as long as these cases go no higher than the D.C. Circuit. What happens after that, I'm I'm less certain of. But the D.C. Circuit uh, has has very strong uh, precedents against transfers of venue that are basically almost insuperable. You basically have to go to uh, voir dire, uh, the jury selection process, and and then if during the jury selection process the trial judge decides, you know what, I'm finding that I I just can't find a a fair jury. Uh, we'll really have to transfer it. And I don't know that that has ever, ever happened. The precedent that they're using is the Watergate defendants themselves. It's a case called Halderman, H.R. Halderman, Halderman versus uh, United States from 1976. And these were the top Watergate defendants, John Mitchell, the former attorney general, H.R. Halderman, basically the chief of staff, and John Ehrlichman, a top uh, senior advisor. They tried to get out of D.C. and um, and failed. And, and the pretrial publicity there was extraordinary. There were, there were hearings, of course, 
congressional hearings, famous Senate hearings, uh, although those had actually, the Senate hearings had actually ended a year before their trial. But then impeachment hearings began. And uh, those uh, came right up until a couple months. I mean, Nixon finally resigned. President Nixon resigned in August. And then the trial began, uh, I think, December of 74. It's a very strong precedent uh, that's hard to overcome. The most plausible argument, the, the key case that some defendants are using is is that it goes back to 1952 and it's from a different court of appeal. So it's not binding on these judges. It's the First Circuit and it's a case that came out of Boston a guy named Dennis Delaney, who had been a collector of internal revenue for the District of Massachusetts. And he had been involved in, or, uh, accused of, and convicted eventually, of corruption. And there was apparently, uh, at that time, a lot of, a, a nationwide spate of corruption in the IRS. And so Congress uh, was investigating that corruption and it had a he- had hearings on Delaney himself just about three months before his trial. They called the very same witnesses that were called at trial. And that, for the first se- circuit, said was, was really too much. It wasn't, strictly speaking, it wasn't a venue case. It was a continuance case. He wanted a postponement of his trial. But in any event... A lot of the January 6th defendants, at least those that are being mentioned, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, those that are are being mentioned at the House Select Committee hearings, they are relying on this Delaney precedent. And so that's that's the closest question. But I really think the Haldeman case, uh, which comes later, which is binding on these judges and uh, really uses a different sort of reasoning is going to trump that. And am I right that as a functional matter, the mechanism by which Haldeman as binding precedent would be challenged would only be in post-conviction appeals, right? It's, there's no, there's no way that the, you know, a trial judge would deny a venue change and somehow that would go pre-trial to either the D.C. Circuit or the Supreme Court for review, right? I think that's, I mean, you could file a mandamus, you know, a, a, a action, but the standards for a mandamus action are extremely high. You you would have to be saying that this was a total abuse of discretion or something like that. I don't see that happening. So yeah, it would be a, a, an appeal after conviction. There is one other interesting issue, um, I think, which is the political homogeneity of D.C., which I think is, you know, as a practical matter, and and what I'm talking about is that more than 90 percent of the District of Columbia voted uh, for the Democratic candidates in 2016 and 2020. So, I, there's no, certainly at the state level, if if you want to liken D.C. to a state, there's nothing like that uh, elsewhere in the country. And I think that is really what a lot of the defendants are worried about, is that the D.C. jurors hate them. Uh, and some put it that way, that they say the D.C. jurors loathe them and loathe Trump supporters and I loathe everything they stand for. Which seems like an excellent argument for not coming to D.C. to commit your federal crimes, right? I think that's right. Um, I, I mean, I like I, I'm not really sure that argues for venue change any more than, you know, going to Texas to the border areas to commit crimes on behalf of illegal migrants uh, would argue for a venue change if you come somewhere and grossly offend local sensibilities, you run the risk that you're going to have a hard time seating a jury that's going to, you know, nullify on your behalf. I think that's right. And the Constitution, remember, creates a lot of presumptions. I mean, I don't have the language in front of me right now, but 
both the Sixth Amendment and Article Three, I think, uh, both talk about uh, you're, you're supposed to be tried in the district, the state and district where the crime occurred. And by and large, because the Sixth Amendment also guarantees an impartial jury, the courts have have decided that if you really can't get an impartial jury in in the local district you can you can get a venue change but uh that's right the but the only thing that makes it at all sort of a live question a close question is that this Haldeman case the Watergate case uh which was en bank it had uh, six judges it was a 5 to 1 ruling and one judge McKinnon George McKinnon brought this issue up uh, sua sponte. Now, his main concern was the Senate Watergate hearings. He thought that th- in, in the same sense that the Delaney hearings, he thought that that had polluted the jury. But that's a pretty good analog to to the 1-6 hearings, of course. Yes. Yeah. But he also was troubled that these were top-level Republican uh, officials, and you had this unusual jurisdiction, this pocket of uh, overwhelmingly Democratic voters. And um, he brought it up sua sponte uh, on his own. And um, the majority was really uh, dismissive, totally dismissive. They almost didn't engage in it, uh, you know, in a reasoned fashion. And of course, the, the numbers back in the, in the 70s weren't even as high as they are now. Nor was the country as divided. Right, exactly. So uh, it's conceivable if this goes higher than the D.C. Circuit, uh, and I, I'm I'm not aware of any. The Supreme Court has certainly never addressed this issue, and just as it, the Supreme Court has never addressed the issue of a, of a, of congressional hearings going on very very close in time to uh, criminal cases. And I should say in that in that vein, you know, the first. Oathkeeper case is supposed to start at the end of September. The the top uh, seditious conspiracy Oathkeeper case could begin September 26th, possibly even September 19th. And at least the last we heard, the January I, I think the January 6th committee was saying that they might have more hearings. So I really hope they do not. If they do have more hearings, that they stay away from Oathkeepers and Proud Boys, because uh, there, there could be an issue. All right. So speaking of things we need to touch base on every now and then, uh, you're the country's leading follower of and <laughs> student of uh, 14th Amendment Section 3 litigation to keep uh, insurrectionists off of ballots. And you have an update for us. Yeah, I think there have been about 11 challenges brought. Nine of them seem to be pretty dead uh, at this point. But one of them is very far along and uh, stands a chance, at least at the trial level. This is a guy named Coy Griffin. C-O-U-Y is that first name, Coy Griffin. He is a county commissioner in New Mexico, Otero County. And he was convicted last March of a misdemeanor in uh, the January 6th riot. Okay, so just to be clear, that conviction makes him different from everybody else we've talked about, right? Doug Mastriani involved there, no charge, right? Marjorie Taylor Greene, not charged. Madison Cawthorn, not charged. But Cooey Griffin actually charged and pled to a misdemeanor for what is basically a trespassing on one six case. Is that right? That's almost right. He, uh, he was convicted at a bench trial. He didn't plead and he's an appealing. In fact, he was convicted on one count, misdemeanor count entering and remaining in a restricted zone. And he was actually acquitted on another count, uh, of disorderly conduct in a restricted zone. 
And this, incidentally, is another Trevor McFadden case, <laughs> Judge Trevor McFadden. He is one of the people that McFadden acquitted in a bench trial on one charge. On one of the two counts. Because he was very orderly in his trespassing. Exactly. He he actually, you know, he, he was a very provocative speaker who urged, you know, he was a st- stop the steal feature speaker. He was head of Cowboys for Trump and his uh, rhetoric was very violent. And he went up to the upper west terrace of the Capitol, and he made a video of himself on social media, and he had 60,000 followers, and he was basically encouraging what was going on, actually the Lower West Terrace, uh, basically encouraging what was going on, really, uh, and 100 feet, you know, 200 feet away from him was that medieval fighting at the Tunnel Archway. He did not go inside the Capitol, and what he did was at one point he uh, led the group in prayer. And and so Judge McFadden believed that, well, he might have been, he credited the possibility that he was actually calming down the crowd rather than riling it up. And so he didn't find that this was disorderly conduct. And so he was acquitted. And so one of... But convicted, importantly to the lit- the current litigation, convicted on the being there at all charge. Yes. Yeah. All right. So what's the state of the litigation? He is actually now uh, some very good lawyers, including uh, the crew group. Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in... (laughs) Washington, D.C. Washington, yes. Yeah. So they are involved and um, they filed what's called a quo warranto action, And a quo warranto is a common law action in state court, which is a a common law action to challenge whether a state official is qualified for the position that he holds. And in fact, quo warrantos were used after the Civil War to challenge uh, Confederate uh, officials. Now, usually a quo warranto has to be brought by a state official, but New Mexico has maybe an unusual law and says that at the county level, as to county level officials, any person can bring a quo warranto. And so three residents have brought it and it was tried last week. It's going to be uh, to a judge and it's going to be, I think the 29th, each side will submit briefs. And then uh, by mid-September, we should have a ruling. It's a very uh, interesting case. Now, Griffin, although he was represented, well represented, actually, at his criminal trial, he is now a pro se. He is representing himself. Basically, I think he ran out of money. And so, as I've written for Lawfare, you know, there are a lot of potential legal barriers to these legal challenges. And he has not raised most of those because he's representing himself. At an earlier stage, he did raise some, but if this is appealed, there's a lot of open legal questions that may still save him. It's an it's an interesting case. His term ends at the end of the year, but he has told me in email conversation uh, correspondence that he does have ambitions for higher office and would not rule out running for president of the United States. And just to be clear, the reason anybody should care about this particular official and this state level litigation in New Mexico, right? Yes. Is presumably that it's potentially precedential vis-a-vis other people, including Donald Trump, right? Absolutely. All of these cases are seen. I mean, the reason such high level legal talent is is getting involved, uh, I think, is is pretty obviously this is sort of a stalking horse for Trump, that if he tries to to run, there will be efforts to keep him off the ballot in various states uh, as a as an insurrectionist. So, yes, in fact, Coy Griffin filed 
pro se uh, for himself a motion to dismiss, trying to argue that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment was itself unconstitutional, and also arguing that his conduct was protected by the First Amendment. I just just want to point out that the Constitution cannot be unconstitutional. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think most people feel that way. And, and in response, there was an amicus brief filed that included um, uh, Floyd Abrams, uh, maybe the most prominent First Amendment practitioner alive. He handled the Pentagon Papers case. Erwin uh, Chemerinsky, the uh, dean of uh, the University of California at Berkeley Law School. Lawrence Tribe, the professor at Harvard. The Martha Minow, a professor and former dean at Harvard. All of these people submitted an, an amicus, as well as several others. So this is more, there's more at stake here than the county commissionership of Otero County, New Mexico. All right. Finally, before we wrap up, we have another matter that is coming to a head, uh, which we've discussed before, which is the dispute among district judges in the District of Columbia about 18 U.S.C. 1512 C2, uh, which is now before the D.C. Circuit. So remind us what the issue here is and what the stakes are and what the D.C. Circuit is being asked to decide. Yeah, the key felony that the government is using in in January 6th cases is called corruptly obstructing a an official proceeding and uh, as you said it's 18 USC 1512C2 and at least i don't know the number right now it's close to 15 judges have approved the use of that statute in these cases one judge has not judge carl nichols found that it cannot be applied to attempting to obstruct an entire proceeding. Instead, it, it's only supposed to be used to, it only refers to attempts to, for instance, destroy evidence or to conceal evidence or to um, falsify evidence. It it's, wasn't anticipated that it would be used to block the proceeding entirely. And I've, I, we have written on lawfare about that particular argument. Yes, Roger, you have a lengthy article about the dispute between Nichols and the rest of the court on this. Yeah. Now the D.C. Circuit is going to resolve it. Yeah. Three different defendants where Judge Nichols tried to or has dismissed that account. The government has appealed in three different cases. They've now filed their first appellate brief. The briefing will be done September 28th. An argument has not been scheduled yet. And as with the venue case, I think at the D.C. Circuit level, the government should be very comfortable. If it goes higher than that, I think this is a very difficult case to predict. I, I think there's even additional arguments about why 1512C2 might not be apt that aren't even raised in these cases. So we, we might not be through with this even, even after this ruling. And how many of the government's cases depend on its reading of 1512C2? More than 285. So it's a big deal. It's, it's like fully a third, I, I think, of all the cases uh, they've brought. So if the government wins and the Supreme Court does not grant cert in the matter, this is a total nothing burger. Three cases get a charge restored. But if the government loses, it's immensely disruptive to the entire January 6th prosecution edifice, right? Exactly, exactly right. And some people, many people have already pled guilty to only one felony count of 1512C2, including Jason Chanley, for instance, including some of the Oath Keepers. 
other than that, it, it, without that, you you basically just have um, assaulting police officers. As serious as that is, I don't want to downplay uh, assaulting police officer, but it just doesn't get at the scale of what was happening here. So is there any reason to think the Supreme Court would intervene on this? Is there any conflict among the circuits as to the meaning of this statute? I don't know of anyone. There are actually some other circuits that have ruled opposite the way Carl Nichols has, that have have suggested that it is broader the way that all the other judges have ruled. So no, I don't. I don't know that there is a conflict, unless you clever lawyers can concoct that argument. But you do remember um, this is a Sarbanes Oxley law case. And uh, many people think of Sarbanes-Oxley as, well, wait a minute, isn't that about financial crimes? And isn't that about the uh, Arthur Anderson uh, shredding documents? And there was that case, and and I can't remember the name now. There was another Supreme Court case already coming out of a a completely different but obstruction of justice statute, also under Sarbanes-Oxley, the one where um, a fish and wildlife prosecution, where uh, a fisherman had thrown an undersized fish back into the sea when he saw the wildlife people approaching. Um, so he was destroying evidence, but I think in a at least a 5-4 ruling, and I think Justice Ginsburg actually wrote it, they felt that wasn't what Sarbanes-Oxley had in mind. They meant documents. So... Um, it's conceivable that uh, the court could on its own decide to take this. Well, we are going to leave it there and wait and see. Uh, Roger Parloff, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks very much, Ben. Appreciate it. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Hey, folks, You know, we need you to become material supporters of Lawfare. You get to not hear the ads. We get income. You get special benefits. It's a really good deal. It's really inexpensive. And you support the show and you support Lawfare's larger work. What could be better than that? www.patreon.com slash lawfare. The Lawfare Podcast is produced and edited by Jen Patya Howell, our audio engineer. This episode is the one, the only Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. And of course, our music, as always, is performed by Sophia Yan. And thanks for listening.